podcast. Welcome to Franchise Sports Media's Locker Room. I'm Joe Arrigo. Today we have a very special guest, UNLV head football coach Marcus Arroyo. Coach, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Man, it's cool. Like, we're in the office, and, and I appreciate the time because this is a long time in the making. Yeah, no, we finally got a chance to uh, to get in here and have some people around, and uh, it's been uh, it's been a long time to make it for a lot of things for us. So it's excited to have uh, some people around and, and, and again have people in the building get after. But we appreciate the time. I mean, you got your game week, you know, prep and everything. So, but let's. I want to start back in your childhood. Now you grew up just outside of Koufax, California, a real small town, a blue collar town. Talk about the town, because I know you told us in the media about it, you know, one stoplight, your mom being a butcher, but talk about what that was like and how that kind of made you into the man that you are. Yeah, I mean, I, got, I come from a town about a thousand people up there near Truckee, California. Um, it's called Colfax, a little truck stop. Um, broken home and, uh, you know, a, a town of some really prideful people, blue collar, uh, about a thousand people. One stop, the stoplight was, is there for uh, just a crosswalk, actually, just so kids can get to the school. Um, not a ton of traffic, but uh, really small town. Uh, humble beginnings. And uh, mom and dad are separated about seven. Dad is a Vietnam vet. He lived uh, down in Sacramento. Mom lived there in uh, Meta Vista, and she, was, uh, she worked in the deli. And uh, tough, loving woman, man. Tough, loving Irish woman with a lot of strength. Raised two boys, uh, took us to all our practices, and got it done, man. How is, a, is an incredible feat, but uh, a really a really cool village to be raised in by some really quality people. Um, and, and a lot of the things that, that I inherently are probably all about, I, I, I have to attribute to the people and the, and, and the parents and the kids and the teachers and the coaches that, that I had in that really small town. And that kind of like molded you into the kind of coach that you are. I mean, cause you were, you played three, four sports as a child, right? Yeah, I mean, there's no, I mean, no different than anybody else, obviously, is, is wherever you come from, I think it, it rubs off on you, um, whether it's, you know, early on or later, you end up kind of saying stuff your, you know, t-ball coach said or your high school coach or somebody you grew up with. And you sound like your best friend's dad yelling at you guys or something or yelling at your kids or something. And you're like, man, I sound like my, my buddy's old man or something, you know. Um, but, yeah, three sports. We played everything, man. It was just a little country town, so there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff to do. We dirt roads, and we did it all, man. Played every sport there was, anything we could do, and uh, a lot of probably – uh, fibers of how I communicate to our, my players or how I compete um, came from that. So you ended up playing up at San Jose State, quarterback up there, and you, you had a good career up there. You still hold some records. You're in the top 10 in three different categories, and you hold a couple single game records still for passing efficiency and I think completion percentage. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, nah, I, I, I lose track of some of those things that, as time goes on and on. So talk about San Jose State. Now, after your career was done, uh, you got into coaching. Like, talk about that transition. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously had an a opportunity to play uh, at San Jose State on scholarship uh, for a coach that, that ended up being someone I really clicked with. Um, started there, you know, as a, a young quarterback, a true freshman, and uh, um, a lot of stuff, you know, learned learned a ton of ball and uh, had a great had a great career. Got educated, and then after that, they. Uh, they offered me a, a GA job um, as I was getting ready to probably work out and I think I was going to go to Europe and try to play football and continue on. And uh, I stopped I stopped chasing that dream when I probably seen a couple guys come back and work out for about the third time for coach for, for NFL scouts. I'm like, man, it just seems tough, man. It seems like, you know, maybe a road that you know, there's there's got to be an alternate road maybe. And so anyhow, they offered me a, a GA job and uh, I didn't really know what that meant besides they continue to pay for my education and so coming from a household with minimal education that was an important thing so I said yeah I said you guys continue to pay for grad school I said shoot let's do it um, I get to be part of football and be part of a team and uh, something that uh, things I love I said let's do it so um, so I did one season there as, as a GA and then off to Texas I went for my first job and never looked back I was 23 and coordinating Texas and then shoot here we are 19 years later so you're the man running the show <laughs> I'm with a team running the show. Well, yeah, okay, okay. So, if you weren't coaching football, like, what would you be doing outside in the, in the real world, so to speak? Man, that's probably a, that's a great question. I, I I don't know. I mean, I don't know what I could do with this much. I don't know what you could do with someone that has to like. I got to be outside. I got to be running around. I got to be working out. Um, I'm hyper competitive, so I'd probably be in every men's league there is, just be being the dude, that guy that's just trying to play everything. Um, 
I wanted to be in grad. I wanted I wanted to go to sport law. I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be front office. I thought I wanted to stay in sports and 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 pick one of those uh, one of those paths. And then as football got into it, man, and and, and I got you know, with coaches and with players and different areas. Of the, you know, I think Texas was a big piece of how football I saw as a uh, culture. You know. Um, I just said, hey, this is this is this is working. Let's run with it. And so, um, I'm really glad I did. And shoot, I've never been more excited and engaged and fired up to be in the role we're in now. I bet. Let's talk about where you came from. Now, you you were at Oregon, led them to a Rose Bowl victory, and then you you came down here. And this is a school traditionally that doesn't have a lot of a lot of history and tradition. And if it is, it's predominantly negative. What what is it like to come from a a, tr- a place where? you have a winning tradition to come here and now you're trying to build that culture and that tradition. I mean, you know, there, there's uh, the, the story of the career has really been been just that though. Every stop has been somewhere where we had to try to rebuild or, or redo or uh, kind of revamp. And uh, I, I'm, I'm accustomed to that. I'm drawn to that for some reason. And I think that's probably goes back to where I'm from. I'm just not afraid of the work. And, and, and uh, you know, I've always been head first in everything. Um, if someone says no, I'm I'm gonna go. You know, or don't do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go make it work. You can't do it. I'm gonna make it work. You know, and so, you know, Oregon was an awesome opportunity. We got there. We were there for three years. We came in behind a staff that um, chipped in an amazing job. They, they'd been they'd had a culture there winning for a while. You know, uh, Coach Bellotti did some amazing stuff there, and 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 and, and Coach before that. And they've had some some lineage. So there'd been some culture. There'd been some wins, and and I think that that the thing that continued to be, as as I've gone through the career, the thing you find out in the NFL or college is that cultures that are, that are accustomed to winning, um, whether it's you know, recent or not, they they still have a kind of feel of what it looked like, you know. And so, we got there and uh, we we changed a lot of stuff. Um, we did things different. We had to get guys bought in. We had to change the recruiting idea. We changed the offense. We changed the defense. We changed the way the mindset is. We changed the weight room. We changed the nutrition um, into what we believed had worked for us at other places we've been, you know, and uh, we crossed some paths and similar with other coaches and a lot of it comes from going all the way back to, to Don James and Gary Pinkle and, and, and Nick Saban in Alabama and Mario would come there and, and I'd been, I'd heard and seen and studied all that stuff before at another stop and um, it was a really good just connection of things and, and we, we owned it, man. We believed in it and uh, and then when you do that and you get a guys that buy in, you get a great staff, uh, things can go other way. So. When this opportunity arrived, um, candidly, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of people saying do it, you know. Right. Um, which, like I said before, why I was gonna do it, you know. <laughs> and so there was just something about this place, man. I I, I, I flew down once between the Pac-12 championship and uh, and the Rose Bowl, and uh, I didn't know much about it, you know. And, and and I started as I started to sink my teeth in it a little bit and see some of the bones, and I know recruiting. Um, recruiting wasn't, you know. I, I, the, that piece it was another piece. I said he couldn't recruit here. And so I felt different about that. And um, I just love the fact that everyone kind of said, don't do it. And I could see and feel something here that made me want to do it. And well, uh, what was enticing about it? Because I mean, to leave Oregon, you were a hot name on, on the coaching circuit. And to leave Oregon where, as you said, you're having a lot of success to, to come to a program that was, that's been struggling. Like, what, yeah, no, what I mean, deal? That, that's a great, that, that, that gets asked a lot too. I think after, you know, 18, 19 years, uh, and, and been the career path and been a lot of different places. Uh, it's humbling, man. You see everything. It's not always it's not always green or it's not always bright and as cool as flashy as you think when maybe you're young or you're certain spots. And so you learn quickly that cultivating a winning type of culture or winning type of mindset or program really has to do with a lot of different things. And, and some of it, not many know, you know, but um, I saw a city I felt like I recruit to. I think I saw bones in a building that people had made a commitment to that's not convenient. Um, I, the fact that everyone kind of said, don't do it, it was, was, I'm like, why? You know, I think I can, I, I felt like I had a connection with a couple guys that I already knew would be interested as staff members, that I could build a, a damn good staff. Um, and then as I got here, I, I learned more about the community. I learned about the people, like there was a, there's an edge and a, and a blue collarness to this town that I probably did, that I didn't know. And as I got to kind of just shortly see people and hear things, man, around here, um, damn, I just, I was, I was bought in, man. I just wasn't what I, it wasn't, 
it wasn't what everyone says. It wasn't what a lot of people, and that happens everywhere, man. Right. You know, I mean, it even happens with people. It happens with people. It happens everywhere, and it just you you gotta you gotta you gotta put your feet on the ground, man. And you start meeting some people, and you start seeing some things, and you just um, I don't know. I've, I've bet on myself my entire life, and. Uh, and, and I know, we know this isn't easy. There's, it's never easy. I don't care if you're at a place that has won a ton, it's always hard. There's so many moving pieces and, there, and, it's, and it's human elements too. It's not, it's, it's not numbers. It, it's, it, there's so much DNA and movement and energy and connection that, that takes place. So I just, man, I just, I fell in love with the spot. I, 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 I knew, I, we know it's gonna be damn hard, but that sure as hell don't scare me. Um, nothing about this scares me. That's that no flinch attitude that you talk about. Yeah, no, not not for one second. Let's talk about some of the changes that you've seen in the program since you took it over. Like, wh what have you seen in the last year and a half? And you've gone through a hell of a lot. I mean, no one expected a pandemic, and then to come in here to deal with that, and then really this is, this really is your first season. So, wh what changes have you have you seen within the program since you've taken it over? Well. You know, after those when we got here, we, we you're putting together a staff. I mean, what you have planned when you're trying to study this, just like anything else. I mean, you need business, you need church, you need family. You got some like preconceived notions and some stuff you you got you think are going to work out. Um, it don't always play that way. You're prepared for that. Are you prepared for a pandemic? Absolutely not. Um, are you prepared for not being able to recruit for a year? Absolutely not. Are you prepared for 40 guys in the graveyard for practice? Absolutely not. But that piece of it, man, is just part of it. You take the lumps, you stare it down, you keep punching, and then come January 18th of this year was the first time that I've got a chance to really see the entire bandwidth of what we signed up for, collectively, from something like we just talked about, the city. Like, we had ne I'd never been out regularly in public in the city or the community. I've never been in many of these high schools. Um, me and wife had never been around. We'd never, I've hardly met any boosters. And... Uh, Come January, we finally get it open, right? And um, you know, it's funny because of a pandemic. You, what people forget too, like you, you got to put yourself. How often did you see like your neighbors or your family because they were worried about, it, right? We barely saw the staff. I mean, you don't hang out, so you, like you don't you don't know each other. Like your your wife's and kids don't meet each other till the year later. So your staff. And the families hadn't met each other for that long period met of time. Met in a way that would make a program grow the way it has to grow. And it's got to go. That is, that is that, that organic ability to connect with people in a, in, a, in a business where we have 150 of us to 105 young men, 18 to 22. And then you got to put a family around. Them. If you're not together trying to do that, it don't work 2D. It doesn't. Try to do it at your own home. Try to do it in a business out here. It just doesn't. So... January this year, the first 10 months here has been fantastic because it made me understand and realize, we, and it made us all in, in life, right? It made us all pull back the layers and go, man, this is a special deal. And it takes it's a really talented group. It takes a really gritty group. It's going to take some TLC. It's going to take some fire. It's going to take some no flinch. And so these guys have really bought into the personality and identity um, in the short time and it hasn't been simple. It's been rough. It's been it's it, but that's okay That's okay. Most stuff that's uncomfortable for you later ends up being really good for you and um, We've had really honest authentic conversations about what we believe we've got to get done and uh, They've been resilient man They've been and they've and, and for the guys who've been around and the guys who've stayed through it. There's gonna be attrition um, You're seeing those guys start to blossom. You're starting to see some older guys go man. This is this feels good They're around here they're here all the time. They hang out, they, they kick it in the, the, the lounge, they're in the weight room, the weight room's on fire, they're in the meal room. So the changes have been just the fact that we've all been together and then you add the whole new programming. Strength and conditioning, top to bottom. Food, academics, player development, off field, mindset. Like, there's just a lot to it. And these 10 months, man, these guys have done a fantastic job of just, uh, of being a family, being together, and, 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 and taking their lumps. Let's talk about the lifeblood of the program, something you've been very good at, talent acquisition or recruiting, because right now it is really more so talent acquisition than it is, you know, the recruiting side of it as well. You've always been great at it, but let's talk about how the transfer portal has affected things and, and kind of how it's impacted the way you recruit now and whether or not you had to kind of shift focus and whatnot. Yeah, so the the portal's been the portal's been on how to be layman and 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 
and the doctorate in the same time. But the portal's been alive, right? Before we got here, you could take a transfer, but there was a sit-out deal, right? They had to, you had to wait a year. So you really had to calculate whether the squeeze was worth the juice to wait a year for a guy. As soon as we got here, they changed the immediate eligibility rule. So now you got a portal and a guy can leave and a guy can come and play. So it, your roster management, talent acquisition, organizational chart, you're ready for it. But then it all of a sudden takes a quick little bleep in the radar to add some layers. So you then have to say, okay, I can use the portal no different than I can use a freshman in regards to instant eligibility and instant impact. It's now you have to do the evaluation on that portal guy and invest the way you can. And so we did it. We've done it here uh, with a few guys um, to fill some gap, to do some things early. I do believe in recruiting and developing the high school piece to really making your culture and your program grow the right way. Um, but we still, it's, that takes a couple years before you fill some gaps, right? And so to do that, we may need to dip back in there a little bit more to, to balance us out in some holes in classes or age, you know? And so um, it's an interesting dynamic. The thing, that, the thing that makes it better this year is they're gonna allow you to, if you, the hard part about your roster management is if you, if you lost a transfer guy up until this year, if you already maxed out scholarships, you didn't get it back. So you could lose guys and you can't replace them and it's just the way it goes. And so it really hurts your program because your depth, let alone the infant stages of the first year, right? So now this year is gonna be the first time where now if you lose, you can go up to seven guys to replace back. You can oversign, you can sign more than 25 to help with your attrition. That'll be a huge piece of, of every program. And so it's gonna be an interesting deal. It, it, we, we've got a really good player to a DPP that are hired and, and our recruiting department's full tilt and uh, we're aggressive. So managing that roster right now and managing every person at Portal and every high school kid and the balance of who we got, where we're going, the arrow up and down. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of draft analytics type of organizational stuff that goes into the value of your guys you got versus value guys coming in, especially early because, I mean, as we've seen the teams we played in the first five games, you don't, the depth you don't have, and that comes back to get you um, early on. And so um, I'm excited about the opportunity that, the, about the way we recruit. Um, I'm excited as hell about to recruit here. Um, and uh, I'm excited that, that the way we do our eval process is gonna be something I think is gonna really uh, lend to being an advantageous process using the portal or, or true high school development. A lot of the kids in high school are look at a lot of different things when it comes to recruiting, not just depth charts and how quick they can play or even I think history means less to kids now than it ever has when it comes to recruiting. One of the things that they're really into is the uniforms. And you know, I got the kids out here and there's people in California and we get calls about it and they always talk about how fresh the uniforms are. And I know you do a great job with that. Talk about the process of going in to not only designing the uniforms, but also choosing them for game days. Well, I mean, first of all, my equipment guy, the, the, Josh, does a phenomenal job of, of kind of getting me organized for it. Um, I am a, I'm probably, a, I guess, a younger coach um, in regards to I'm growing up in, I grew up in a shoe generation. I mean, I grew up with, I grew up with Jumpman, you know, I grew up with Gatorade, I grew up with Jordan. I mean, sneakers were like deal. So I think generationally, when you grow up and you kind of see these things being attractive to recruiting and it starts to work out, you're kind of like, well, that lends to kind of what we grew up in. And so, um, I, you know, I, I don't spend a ton of time on it. It's not anything we spend a time in fall. We do it all preseason. We spend a bang out of time to go, okay, here's the jersey stuff. Here's the new Nike stuff. What do we like? What do we want some jersey to be like? And I give Josh some ideas. He brings this stuff, and then he, he carries it all out. And uh, I think that there was two pieces coming in here that I really felt strongly about. Number one was obviously the relationship I had coming from Oregon and the Nike and what I'd seen they them bring to our world in recruiting, let alone just the edge and and the uh, and, and, and the attraction and, and and where the arrow was going and how they've done things. And so to bring that into where I saw this city and I saw where I could really bring this city in here with that stuff was important. So I tried to make every call I could and try to get as close as we could to something that I felt was representative of, of, of Nike and our school and our city and our community and, and being new. And then I let the, the equipment guys run with it, man. So um, we're, we're blessed to have them. We're excited about our relationship there and, and that'll be something we continue to do. Let's talk about football, the old, the old cliche of football, where it's a game of inches. Mm -hmm. And this year, it means that more than ever. And it's not even more a game of inches. I mean, literally, there's a handful of plays and you've talked about it openly. Mm -hmm. 
you're you've played some of the one of the toughest schedules in college football. How has that molded your team and, and talk about the difference between the game of inches and how that correlates to where you're at now and how close you are to winning ball games on a consistent level? Well, I mean, it's Reuters head uh, in, in the coaching world perfectly. You know, unfortunately, sometimes it works out in your advantage and it doesn't. But you're you're always looking for those opportunities um, when you're teaching a team what wins football games what wins games, what wins, shoot, in life. When you get to a certain level, man, and you start to get to these degrees where the margins for separating good from great and wins from losses become really small, you give all these examples to kids and sometimes they don't, it doesn't register because they just don't, they don't see it that way or they've never been taught to see it that way. We've been in three games and the games that we've been closest in, obviously, are the ones that we're really dialed into and the ones that are probably most like us. Uh, those are fourth quarter games and one's an overtime game, literally of inches. Um, we've, we've gone through in the bye week and we've looked at, you know, I try to go through and be as thorough as I can without getting too calculated and analytical in that regard. But, you know, the example I gave our guys, it's 495 plays in three games of offense, defense, special teams. And, the, and literally the ball game comes down to 10 to 12 in a swing, 10 to 12 plays collectively. Well, the percentage is like two to 3% of everything you did then. And if that two to three percent dictates the mindset of my building or my coaches or my team, then it better be a three and two mindset, not an 0 oh and five mindset, because it's that far. If you're going to put yourself in a mindset where my guys are so banged up and beat up by, by this or outside about, oh, you're just, you know, no, it's 10 plays. It's 10 plays and we got to understand what those were. And so I'm, it's my, it's the, I got the onus to put on my guys to understand how important that is, that one play, and, and the totality of those plays. You don't know when it's gonna happen, but you're trying to get that across to your guys and impart how things work, man. And, that, and then so you get those things in a bye week and you get to show them like, hey, if I get that timeout, if I get that timeout back I used because we made a mistake here, I get to use in this two minute drive and give Cam a break and think about two more plays. If I get this back, if we, if we do this right, if we're this further, you know, if we're in our lane on a cover, cover team and it's the 12-yard difference of a field goal versus a punt, those things that can switch the game, that's, that's the momentum of a game. It's just hard to uh, put in context when you're in it until you really extrapolate it and go, change those four plays and what happens? And so, man, it's just part of the growth. It's part of, that's, that's part of this game. That's part of teaching, man. And, and so when we go out there and practice this week, that was what it was about. I found two to three plays in every practice, and everybody knew I was going to find it. Everybody. It happened in a two-minute drill one day. You could, you could have dropped, heard a pin drop because they knew. It was like, man, that's it. That's the, that's the one play right there. And so to see those guys, I get fired up talking about it because that makes me go, um, is when they hit that, when they get that two to three percent back and they see it go, that's the gas. And that's what makes a program go. Because otherwise, they sometimes don't know what wins or loses. And then you just get lucky. And, and, and I'm not into that. How has the team's attitude changed? Now, I, I can tell you from previous years, we've seen a major difference this year. In past years, there's a lot of finger pointing, uh, attitudes change. But this year, with, with when we're down there shooting pictures, they come back and tell me, they, they're like, look, Guys are out there helping each other. They're talking about they're lined up wrong. What did you see? It's a completely different attitude. Mm -hmm. When it, is that something? I mean, you have to be proud of that as a coach because they got to be taking on your competitive nature if, if that's the case. Well, I think yeah. I mean, I'm I'm humbled to hear that from from the vantage of someone who's been in it. I don't pretend to know, and I don't pretend to judge it either. Uh, I think the reality of it is, you know, you want your family, your kids, or your team to be a reflection of of hopefully what you hold near and dear to you, what you think is important. And so I've probably been that way since you've been here. I've been upfront, in your face, honest, humble, competitive, aggressive, uh, tactical. I mean, with these guys, like there's everything I'm doing with them is I'm right in front of them. There's, there's no secrets in there's no, I'm, in, I'm trying to eliminate the gray because that's when you start to lose guys, man. You start to lose you start. You don't got enough fabric in in this in, in, with with this many people. You can lose people, man. That the cracks get big. It's the glue, man. It's the glue. It's it's the ability to communicate with these guys on a real level, 
and being organic and being authentic and being and being demanding, never demeaning. And that's the one thing that I that I can't stand. I just don't believe in it. I don't believe you can get there's a time and a place to be to be ultra demanding and maybe to a point where you get but that's another time where you got to follow up and get back in there real quick and make sure he understood you the right way because demanding and demeaning are, are two two very different things and i think that when you hold guys to a certain accountability you start to find out that they really want that we all do whether we know it or not most of the time you look back and you maybe pause for saying like man i, I needed that coach or that person in my life to be hard on me um, I needed him to tell me the truth um, and we do it here a lot and so if we can see that coming out in our practice or the way the guys are in the building that's what I said that like they seem to like each other now they seem to like to know how to work they, they're disciplined accountability we have no we've had no issues I've had not one police issue I've had no, no off-field issues we've rarely had guys miss me late to meetings we have guys not miss buses meals um, because it's habit for me right I mean, we say it all the time, these guys will tell you, first you form habits and habits form you. And right now our habits are treating people right, working our tail off, and trying to build a good football program that wins football games the right way. And so that's the only thing on our mind. And so if that's reflective on how we play in the field and we're tough as hell, then yeah, I am proud about that. You talked about family, we just talked about, you mentioned family. And you're a father, you're a husband and you're the CEO of a division one football program. Is there a way or do you have a way to find a balance between home and work? Cause your job is extremely demanding. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably a, uh, that's a search that a lot of us in this business, uh, look for, for a long time. You try to find it because uh, you know, you, you look back in your mentors and hopefully they, they did you right. They did you a solid by showing you how to do things in an industry. We work 80 hour weeks and you're home, you're gone. For, you're in military. I mean, your family's at home. You're, I mean, I'm here at five in the morning. I'm home at 10 and every day, seven days a week. Like I, if I see my daughter in the daylight, it's surprising to her. You know, it's like one of those things. It just, it's very humbling and it's hard. Um, and you got to work your tail off through it, you know? And uh, I've done a much better job in the latter part of my career um, doing that for myself. And I think that, you know, unfortunately we've had a, you know, I've, I've had last year, the last year at Oregon and then the second year at Cal, we actually lost, a, I've lost two children in this career and buried them in season. And um, that really changed probably the way I, and not probably, it changed everything I do. Specifically, the time spent on work and the time spent away and the perspective on why I tell these guys on certain, on bye week that they don't need, I don't want coaches in here till 10 o'clock because I want you to take your kids to school. Why tonight on Thursday is date night and you get home for dinner, you're not here, you're gone. Um, you know, why Sunday's donut Sunday at our house. And I'm up and, I'm at Pink Box getting it. I don't care what time it is. If I gotta be here at six, I'm at Pink Box at 4 a.m. She's getting donuts, you know? It's like, that's just what we do. Um, it, it, it's a balance, man. It's hard. I mean, you see it all over uh, in, every, in, in this industry. So it's, uh, and then you're, you're managing the team. So you're responsible for the whole building, all these kids, all these families. So it's a, it's a responsibility I take really, really serious and the responsibility to be, um, I guess, awake um, to the to the reality of you got to let coaches and you got to become more than just you know coach right you know you got to be dad you got to be husband you got to you got to be a good dude you got to have life behind it too have you have you been able to you know you talked about bringing the families together in the last 18 months but have you done anything here to bring the staffs together on a consistent basis the staff and their families uh, yeah, so we have, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I open the building to everybody that's in the family. Like, if there's kids here during the work day, it really doesn't bother me. Like, if there's a, if the guy, I trust the staff. I, I, I do, I trust that guys I've hired are going to get their work done, you know. It's not to say that there's romper room, don't get wrong. But if your kids or your family's got to stop by, that takes precedence. Um, every Sunday night, um, after on a weekend, because we practice, we have our we wrap up the game on Sunday and we have a practice at night, usually in the PM for about an hour. 
every Sunday night's family dinner. And so the whole, all the families and the kids, they come to Fertitta here and they eat with us on the team. And kids are everywhere, there's bikes, there's kids running all over the place, they're down in the equipment room, they're, not, they're in the weight room, around the field. Um, that's what it's about, man. They're here till about 8 o'clock and then we go back to work for another couple hours and go home. Um, we got we, as much stuff as we can do. And, and again, it's only, this is the first time we've been together since January that we've actually been able to have families here protected the right way, you know? And uh, we'll do, you know, we do a Halloween deal because my daughter's birthday is around Halloween. So it'll be, if there's not kids running around here during Halloween week somehow with costumes and we do have candy out, then everybody's fired. Didn't you guys do that last year? Like give out candy to the families? To yeah, the so last year, because Halloween was just, you know, was so kind of uh, banged up, you know, we didn't really to do. I got every, I told everybody to open their doors and we all get, we decorated the offices and had candy in here and all the kids and coaches and stuff and got dressed up and we had like trick or treat up in, in Fertitta. So that's pretty cool. That's really cool. You, you talked about um, people and you've taken a chance on some people that, you know, in the transfer portal, even in recruiting, you brought some people in that, you know, giving them a second chance. Is that something that's inherent in you coming from where you came from, that blue collar mentality? Yeah, probably. I mean, I'll, that, that, I mean, yeah, it's probably a little bit of everything, right? It's what you believe in, what you've experienced, who you've been around. Um, you know, this game will humble a lot of people. They can be at other stops and maybe it didn't work out. They can be around other guys and maybe it didn't work out. Maybe they're immature and it's taking more time to get through than others. Do I say that part of that's probably from being from a blue collar town that, that, that's real with people and kind of takes time to really find things out? Yeah, probably. Probably from being a tough dad and mom and, you know, it comes from a tough place and you see some tough things and you realize people can change and they may be just part of a bad environment and they need to get out. Um, yeah, that's probably part of it. But I think also my mentors were, were really good at saying, hey, make sure you're, you're not getting blinded by something that's, uh, that many don't want to sink their teeth in and get to know. Because, I mean, if you just did the top 50 guys I've had in 19 years, I bet 12 of them weren't valedictorian, perfectly cookie cutter type deals, clean papers. You know, it's like there's some baggage on some most of those guys, you know, and you had to get down to it or you had to get it out of them or you had to reshape it. And that's what we do. That's what you do. They're 18, 19, 20. And, uh, and, and none of us, we're all imperfect, man. But at that age... It's hard, and it gets harder now. You know, it gets harder and harder, especially if they ain't gotten role models or figures or let alone people just have a regular conversation with. It's just, it's kind of a, I don't know. It, it, you gotta make sure you sink your teeth in, in, in a lot of these things because they're still human. Describe your program to somebody who has no idea what you know football's about. Well, I mean, in the first 10 months, uh, I, I actually say this all the time. If someone, I tell our guys this all the time too, because I think it's probably good regardless, not just football. If someone came in your house or your building or watched you practice, what would they write down without talking to you? Like what's reflective of you? What do you do? And so we say it all the time. I say, I want an unrecognizable practice. Meaning, if someone had watched this before, or someone had seen this place before, or someone had seen you before, I want them to come in and go, this looks totally unrecognizable from, in a positive way. You know, like that looks like something I haven't seen before. You know, I want to see, um, I want to see a, a culture that's, that talent should be the last box we should check. It should be a group that's got great effort. Like they just try hard. Do, just try hard at anything. Try hard to be, try hard from, to, to sprint from the parking lot, which I can see, and I know you got five minutes to get this meeting, and you're sprinting in your slippers trying to get here on time. Like I love that, because like it's important. Try hard to, to, to make your test perfect on a Thursday night for your coach. The effort late in a practice. The effort early in a practice. The effort in stretch. The effort when no one's watching. I tape stretch sometimes. Like I tape when you don't think there's film. Oh, damn. Because I want to like show guys like how you do something, how you do everything. Like your effort, your commitment, your discipline, your pride, your effort. Like you, you, like that all, that's got to come out. That's got to come out before you tell me you how big and strong and fast and how high you jump. Because it don't matter. I know a lot of dudes like that. And, and that don't matter. That don't mean nothing. Um, 
it's just that's what I hope when people come by I hope they say man that's just an identity there these guys they look they look accountable they look like they like each other they look tough they look like they play hard they look like they care and they look they look like they have some humility too not afraid to screw up you know and then shoot if they say they treat people right, that's a big thing too, how they treat people, you know, like around each other. So that's what I hope you see. Okay, second to last question. I'm a guy you want to come to UNLV. You're at, you're in my in-home visit. <laughs> sell me, a, sell, I, want the, I want the Coach Royal treatment. Why Vegas is the spot for me? Why I need to come to UNLV? Why isn't it? Why not? What do you want? You want, you want a community? You want a brand new stadium? You want a beautiful $40 million facility? You want coaches with 70 years of Power 5 experience? You want 10 years of Super Bowl? You want a guy who's been coaching quarterbacks for years? You want guys who coached Matt Ryan for years? You want guys who've coached on the San Francisco Niners? You want good dudes that are family guys, have kids who've done this for a really long time? You want a setup that's academically set up so you can have a degree outside of these walls because that'll be much longer than anything else? You want to talk to someone who knows how important it is to the first one in their family who's got one? You want you want a you want a weight coach who's who who's been in a national championship who comes from a pedigree from Georgia to Alabama to Oregon to the cut of the rug as far as the way we do things and build guys up in player development. You want a head coach who's going to stand in front of you and never behind you. You want I mean what do you want? You want you want uniform. You want gear. You want a city that's alive and edgy and loves winners and like looking for something. Good people that work the tail off in a gritty town. None of, and hardly any people landed on third man. So. I mean, if that's what you're about, come on. I love it. I love it. Last question. Not to sound self-serving or narcissistic at all, but what would it mean to you, or what's it going to mean to you, to get the first win of your as a head coach at this level? Yeah, it, it, people have been asking this a lot. What's it be like to get your first win as a head coach? I don't want to minimize it or undermine it. It's going to be it'll be, it'll be amazing. In my head, I've already, I've already had a bunch. I've won a lot of different things. Um, I've won my team, won, won, won my staff. But the one thing about this job, man, is that if, it's, if, you, if you're self-serving, you're in the wrong industry. You are. Dude. You, if you're coaching college or pro football or sports for you to get an individual accolade to get one win, it's gonna be a short career, bro. You're in this to, to stack wins. Like I'm in this because I want, I want this to be, I want groundwork laid. I want to plow the field, plant some seeds, and it's strong bamboo. Like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the multiple wins. Um, and again, if we do the things that that that, that win, and we and we do the stuff that's right between each other, and our mindsets right, the scoreboard will take care of itself. It really will. I mean, it's, it would have already. There's only a couple things, you know, it's a 2%. So um, I will be, I'll be elated for my team. I'll be fired up because they worked the tail off. I'll be elated for this town. I'll be elated for the people who made a commitment to this building, to what we're doing. And, uh, and then I'll be excited for the next week because they get to stack it then and stack it and stack it. And that's, that's what's fun. And that's building that culture you talked about earlier. And that's building things that can stay for a while. Well, Coach, I appreciate your time and taking it out right before game week. This has been The Locker Room. Marcus Rowe, head coach of UNLV. I'm Joe Arrigo. We'll talk to you soon on FranchiseSportsMedia.com.